All right, happy question show day. Now, before we get into the question show, I wanna show you this. This is awesome. So this is a $20 coin that was released by the Canadian Mint, and it was designed to celebrate the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And check this out. It's got a tiny little slice, a little chunk of a meteorite, of a metal meteorite embedded right into the coin. So I'm gonna, I got some information I'm gonna read here. Um, it's, uh, it was designed by Canadian artist Alexandre Lafort to, is a photorealistic interpretation of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's 150th anniversary logo topped with a genuine iron meteorite fragment that's a tribute to the contributions of the RASC members. And the observe has, uh, the, the opposite side has, has the Queen, of course. So congratulations to the Royal, Astro Royal Astronomical Society. This is awesome. Thanks for sending me one. Uh, it's so cool that this is a Canadian coin. All right, let's get on with the questions. Irritable John syndrome. They say there's a supermassive black hole at the center of almost every galaxy. I'm curious what would be at the center of a galaxy if there was no supermassive black hole. I can't think of anything else with enough gravity to attract all the stars and materials that make up a galaxy. It's important to understand that that the supermassive black hole at the heart of, say, the Milky Way is not the anchor of the galaxy. It didn't form and then suck all of the stars and planets and stuff into orbit around it. The supermassive black hole formed kind of in conjunction with the galaxy. And so think of it instead. What really a galaxy is, is this gigantic halo of dark matter right? 90% of it is dark matter. And then there is the regular matter that we can actually see, the stars and stuff. And it is sort of embedded within this halo of dark matter. And this whole thing is rotating around. And the, these supermassive black holes, they happen to be at the middle because they're very dense and they sort of make their way down to the middle of the galaxy. If there was no supermassive black hole, it wouldn't really make a difference to the galaxy. And actually astronomers see other galaxies out there that don't have supermassive black holes. So Triangulum is a good example. It's a galaxy, it's very big and bright, and astronomers seem to think that it doesn't have a supermassive black hole. They can kind of tell by the way that the central core of the galaxy functions that it doesn't seem to have a black hole there. And so there, there must be others, because this is a fairly big one that's fairly close. So the if you, it's important to really see, right, that that these black holes are not vacuum cleaners that are sucking in material. They are just places with a lot of mass. If you replaced the, the, the sun with a black hole with the same amount of mass, all of the planets would just continue to orbit around it perfectly happy. So uh, it's not the black hole that's the anchor to the galaxy. It's the dark matter. Ankur Bhatnagar. Instead of shooting the payload in the opposite direction at 31 kilometers per second of the Earth's orbital velocity, how about shooting with just a couple of kilometers per second, like two kilometers per second? Wouldn't it slowly spiral down into the sun if it's moving in Earth's direction, but at a slightly lower speed? So this question is a response to the video I did about how it would be really, really hard to throw nuclear waste into the sun because you would essentially have to cancel out the Earth's orbital velocity around the sun, which is 30 kilometers per second. So you would have to shoot a rocket in the opposite direction that the Earth is rotating at 30 kilometers per second. That would essentially cancel out its orbital velocity and it would fall into the sun. And so the question that you're asking is like, well, couldn't you just go two kilometers per second and then let it spiral into the sun? And orbits don't work that way, right? So I see what you're wondering. You know, if you launched your rocket and had it go two kilometers per second more slowly, then it would now be orbiting the sun at 28 kilometers per second. And what it would do is it would go into a different orbit. It would lower its orbit a bit. It would move probably in this sort of elliptical orbit that's different from the orbit that the Earth is taking. And it would cross the Earth's orbit. Um, but it would now be in a completely different orbit. But it would continue this new orbit forever. You know, it might have some interactions with the Earth, but essentially you have not sent it into the sun. It's only when you cancel out all of its orbital velocity that you can actually get it into the sun. It's not going to spiral. It's just going to go into a new orbit and just happily do this new orbit forever. Trap for three. Why do scientists just assume other life forms breathe oxygen or even use it? I get this question all the time. And, you know, and so the idea is like, like 
we don't even know what alien life could possibly look like. Why are we looking for life to be anything like we already understand it? Why are we looking for water? And why are we looking for oxygen? And why are we looking for these kinds of chemicals? And the answer is that we don't know what it's going to be like, right? Astronomers or uh, planetary scientists, when they look here on Earth, they find that wherever there's liquid water, there's life. So it means that that life can have a can get a foothold in you know once those conditions are there you've got water you've got some kind of energy source they're good to go and so as we explore the solar system we find these other places that are going to have similar conditions we know under Europa or under Enceladus there's going to be water uh, liquid water and there seems to be more chemicals for life so it makes sense to start looking at the places as we understand them and then maybe once we've run out of those places let's start looking in the places that we don't understand it and I'll give you an analogy and I use this all the time right is that if I ask you to give me an apple the first place you would look is maybe your fridge and then maybe you would go to the store or maybe you would look at an apple tree and if none of those panned out then you might start looking in the in the weird places like the trunk of your car or maybe in your shoes or uh, you know some strange place inside your computer maybe there's an apple in there now the chances are they weren't where you were expecting to find them and so you kind of wouldn't even know where to look after that so first thing look in all the places where you know where they are then go after that and this is what astronomers are doing they're trying to exhaust all the places that where life could be as we do understand it and once that runs out then we'll start looking in all the places that we don't understand it and actually NASA has done a lot of work in trying to figure out what those could possibly be they figured out other chemicals that could work like as a solvent other chemicals instead of carbon could it be made of silicon things like that so Scientists have definitely thought about these other possibilities, but it just makes sense to just start looking for where the life is you do understand it, and then the life is you don't understand it. XAM Key Sly. It's 3.14 a.m. and I see the really bright star next to the moon. I'm in California. After you posted that comment, we corresponded back and forth, and it turned out that the object you were looking at was Mars. And I'm not surprised that you saw this really bright star in the sky at 3.14 in the, in the morning right now is possibly the best place to see planets in the sky in more than a decade right you've got Mars at its closest approach since 2003 it's incredibly bright you've got Jupiter is very bright just past its opposition Saturn just past its opposition which means sort of the closest point in the in the sky the brightest that we're gonna see it Venus is really bright in the in the west um, and even Mercury is visible and of course you can look down and see the Earth so you can see six planets on one night so uh, and if so if you want now is the time if you don't have a telescope find a friend who has a telescope get them to show you some stuff in the night sky to see the planets there has never been a better time than right now to see the planets in the sky Kenny S alas a channel that has content I don't already know thanks Cool, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, one of the benefits of being a journalist, right? I, my job is to investigate what's going on with the space agencies and your, you know, the scientists, and I read research papers and f read requests for proposal from aerospace firms and things like that. And I get a chance to dig up a lot of really kind of cool, interesting projects that are happening right now. And, and I can really tell that this is the kinds of stories that you want me to report. And so hopefully you're going to see more and more of this into the future. Ryan Glowinski. If the universe is expanding like a balloon, getting blown up every second, it gets 68 to 75 kilometers bigger. What happens with all the extra space that appears every second? I'm probably crazy, but what if the universe naturally created time travel so that the space doesn't just stay empty for millions of years waiting for a galaxy to form? What if it naturally speeds up without, within milliseconds these galaxies are made, taking up this empty space? Whoa, you had me and you lost me there. Um, the universe is expanding. And this expansion is caused by the leftover momentum from the Big Bang, as well as this accelerating force that's happening from dark energy. But the expansion, all it's doing is it's just making the existing material in the universe less dense. It's pushing it farther and farther apart. And an analogy to sort of think about is like, imagine you're baking some bread and the bread is, has, is rising and you're getting these big bubbles that are forming inside the bread. And in that is just gas, right? Um, the galaxies 
are the bread part, the gluten around these opening spaces. And what's in, what's in the inside of these vast cosmic voids is nothing or very less, you know, very less dense areas of the universe. And over time, as this expansion continues, the matter is going to get concentrated into galaxy clusters and these walls and, and these various formations, while the gaps are just going to open up more and more in between them. So there's no new matter coming into the universe. There's no time travel with galaxies forming. It's just that everything is getting less dense. Nick the Undying. The way Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it, in a nutshell, when the aircraft became a thing, the Army handled all the planes. It was the Army's Air Force, and then it branched off and became its own branch. And now it's the same with space, which has been mostly handled by the Air Force. Yeah, I did a video about the announcement of Space Force about a month and a half ago, two months ago. And then during at that time, I was like, oh, I think Trump is probably trolling the media. He's not serious. And then he did another announcement a couple of weeks ago. and. Apparently he was serious, so no problem. Um, what is this going to mean? What is this going to become? I think you're exactly right, which is that when a new technology gets developed, when a new sort of sphere of influence gets developed, it begins as a part of another branch of the military. And so right now, all of the space operations are handled by the Air Force, by the 45th Air Space. Force Command, Space Command Wing. So they have a whole group of the Air Force that just deals with space. And in the future, you can imagine it's inevitable, right? As we get more out into space, we get more mining, more colonization, more exploration, that the military is going to go along and it's going to have its own separate division of the, of the, of the military. It's going to be Space Force. Although I'd like the term Starfleet better, but that's just me. Um, that just seems like a natural thing to have happen. Now the question though is, what is the announcement that Trump is making? Or is this just a shuffle of the, the people who used to be in the Air Force who handled the space operations and now they're in this new group called Space Force? Is it an organizational chart change? Or are they actually going to be funding it with new hardware? Are they, are they going to give it specific missions? Is there going to be research done? We just don't have the details. And so right now, I can't tell you anything apart from he says he wants to have a Space Force. Joe Anderson. Any idea how much of the James Webb observation calendar is already filled up? What's the test subject to see if it's up and running? Who gets or already has the first real slot of observation time or what it might be used for? Any idea when they're going to go for a 10-day deep field type image? Well, right now we just found out that the James Webb Space Telescope has been delayed again to 2021, March 2021. This one feels like it's a lot more likely, uh, but still, it, there could be more delays. We don't know. Uh, and, and then, like right now on the James Webb website, they're accepting proposals uh, and will be until the end of 2019, although they'll probably kick that date farther back as the launch date pushes farther back. So until then, that's when someone who's working with James Webb is going to take all of these different proposals, shuffle them into the schedule, figure out which is going to go when, and then let astronomers know when they've got time on James Webb. The first thing they're going to do, as you said, is they're going to take a you know, that first light image, the first time they turn on the telescope and gather a test image of some source, which is going to be really exciting. Uh, and then, as you said, they're probably going to do some version of the deep field survey, but with James Webb in infrared and peer right to the edge of the observable universe and see these galaxies that were forming as early as possible at the beginning of, of time. Uh, I can't wait for it to happen. Come on, James Webb, launch. Christopher Kerrigan Brawley. That word, Worcester, it's unfortunately pronounced Wooster. Emphasis on the woo. What you didn't see, and we'll probably see it for the Patreon blooper, is us arguing about how to pronounce Worcester or Wooster, as I learned, or Wooster if you come from there. And of course, I you know should have known when I said it because there's you know uh, Wooster sauce, Worcestershire, Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire sauce, which is the same word, but it's, and it's pronounced Wooster. So uh, I apologize to everybody who comes from Wooster uh, and Wooster, Worcestershire. I won't get it. I won't make that mistake again. Cayenne 1106. Could we use ion engines to launch a rocket or even reuse it as well? I'm possibly a madman. You are a madman, but you're my kind of madman. Unfortunately, there's just not enough thrust 
from an ion engine to be able to launch a rocket from Earth's gravity. You've got to overcome the, the force that's pulling you down, this acceleration, this 9.8 meters per second per second that's pulling you down towards the Earth. And an ion engine, no matter how big, can't put out enough thrust to be able to do that. It's only when the forces on your spacecraft are perfectly balanced when you're out in orbit or deep in the solar system that you can start to fire that ion thruster and over the days, months, weeks, years, uh, you can actually build up those tremendous velocities. Right now, hold a piece of paper in your hand and feel the force that's coming down onto your hand. That is the amount of thrust that an ion engine can provide. It's just not very much. But out in space, when there's no forces acting on you in an, un, you know, in an unbalanced way, you're not being accelerated toward the planet, uh, then you can thrust and thrust and thrust for very long periods of time and, and take advantage of it. So different rockets, different engines work in different places. Chemical rockets work down here on Earth where you need an enormous amount of thrust to get out into orbit and then out in space. The ion engines take over and they're very efficient to take you very high velocities. Slade Greenway. Mind thoroughly expanded. Great video, Fraser. If it was possible, it would be great for you to interview some of the chief designers, engineers that are building these amazing robots and missions. I get a chance to interview these people all the time. Uh, now, one thing to remember is that we do the weekly space hangout, which is, of course, this weekly roundup of space news with me and Dr. Paul Matt Sutter and Dr. Morgan Renberg and Dr. Kimberly Cartier. They're the co hosts. And every week we pretty much have a guest, and the guests are amazing, right? People from NASA, astronauts, astronomers, space scientists, people working in all aspects of the field. So, pretty much, we have a new guest every week. And then the other thing that I'm trying to do is I'm doing this live QA on my channel with this open space and I'm going to try and bring more people onto that as well. Um, at the time you're watching this, David Brin, the author, science fiction author David Brin has agreed to come on to the open space Q&A. It's just a live Q&A with you and you get to ask all your questions of these people. So uh, if, you know, I need your help. So if there are ideas for people who you want to see interviewed or people who you think I should reach out to or people who I should interview and do the live QA and organize with, let me know. The even better way is to join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the, um, this is the group of people who've kind of come together and act as the executive producers of a lot of the shows that we do. And what you'll find is when you become one of the members of the, of the Weekly Space Hangout crew, uh, you get to become an executive producer of pretty much any show that I do and reach out to anyone you want and invite them to come on one of the shows. And I'll do my part. I will interview them. I will put on a show. And if you want to reach out to them, you can do this. And a lot of the guests that you see, these are just from the volunteers as part of this community writing an email and saying, I'm an executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout. Will you come on the show? and inevitably they say yes. So you have more power than you think and let's work together. I need your help and let's uh, get more cool content into these various shows. Scott Rick, is there a way to protect non-Earth construction projects, landing pads, roads, etc.? I can see us building one only for an asteroid to take it out. This is going to be one of the big sort of unexpected hazards of building on Mars and the Moon and places like that that are out in space is there's no protection whatsoever from micrometeorites coming in and ruining your day. And there are fresh meteorite impacts on Mars that are found all the time, fresh meteorite impacts on the Moon. Anyone, any city that exists on the surface of the moon for any long period of time is going to need some kind of long term micromediate protection, and there's really no protection from the larger objects. The Earth's atmosphere protects us from the vast majority of these objects as they slam into the atmosphere, they burn up, and they don't cause us any damage on, on the surface. But on the moon, on Mars, on asteroids, there's no way to stop them. So one of the ideas that I've heard, I mentioned this in this, this uh, show about getting, building an artificial magnetosphere on Mars, and one of the ideas was to build this big solenoid into, this big donut into the surface of Mars, and you could put a micrometeorite shield up the top of it, so you could sort of put your city underneath this dome and be protected from both the radiation and the micrometeorites. But beyond a certain size, there's no stopping these things. They're just going to slam into them. So most people are going to want to spend most of their time underground, which is another reason why the Earth is awesome. So. All right, we've reached the end of this question show. As always, thanks everyone who put in your questions. If ever a question pops into your brain, just 
type them down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. All right, I'll see you next week.